And we're back with any relation to the crisps, the tale of my trials and tribulations running a business as part of my university degree. Uh, this episode is about my big Korean PowerPoint adventure, so it is named in my document that I submitted uh, to the university as like the summary um, official thing to, to talk about what I did in my year out. So, bit of context, like I said, this is a year out that I took from university to run my business, which is Seabrook Media, a design and video production agency. Um, the, if you watch episode one, I talk about how I got into Seabrook Media and how things got started. Uh, essentially, was a way of getting more experience, but as things developed, became much more of a job, a full-time responsibility. And this year, what's called a year in enterprise that my university offered as an alternative to the year in industry or a study abroad as many UK universities offer this year was a means of really cramming a load of experience related to running a business and developing as an entrepreneur into about 15 months so each episode is a little um, different story so far we've covered my leads to New York student uh, leadership program We've covered building a computer that I didn't think I could do, but then later proved to myself that I could do. And we're now on to my big Korean PowerPoint adventure. So in August of 2017, so this is the summer before officially the year in enterprise started, I was sent to South Korea. And this is because the university each year with the four year in enterprise students that there are every year, send them to a boot camp. So they send them to um, like a, a session filled like residential where they'll go over things like business plans and marketing and loads of little business things. We were really lucky because usually the university sends them to like Huddersfield or Sheffield or something. Uh, we got to go to South Korea thankfully our year out timed in well with a, a, a donation uh, to the university and they sent us all to the Global Entrepreneurship Boot Camp at Keist University which is outside the city of Daejeon in South Korea and the point of this was to spend two weeks collaborating with other international students participating in workshops and speaking to business leaders and visiting businesses in South Korea to just gain perspective really it was an opportunity to just go and learn as much as possible in order to develop our entrepreneurial ability our understanding of processes of team working and the focus of this episode really is in the team working because this is where we we really had some good experiences with with sort of working together especially with strangers which a lot of people, especially if you're typically more anxious or nervous or um, not confident in your in your you know your, your abilities to, to work with other people, this was a very eye opening experience for me because it was an environment to if you want to put yourself in my shoes, imagine being told that you're going to go to a totally different country, stay in a totally f different university, work for two weeks daily with people you have never met before to achieve a common goal so the challenge was pretty high um as well as that which i will probably dip into but um isn't really you know entrepreneurially much of a focus um there was the element of you know getting to experience this whole new culture and that sort of thing which is fun and was a lot of fun and I very much would like to go to South Korea again. I've never been to Asia up until that point. Um, had absolutely no conception of what it would be like. I'd say I was probably a little bit nervous um, just because it was so far flung. But it was such a good time. So anyway, similar to the New York program, it had a, the same sort of theme in that we would develop a business plan and pitch but the difference with uh, this one was it wasn't to do with smart cities and solving city problems it was to do with solving on-campus problems so using the campus as almost a bit of a microcosm 
it was sort of perfectly aligned to the stuff we were studying. So the curriculum was that in the first week we would look at how you formulate a business plan from start to finish. Things like finding an idea, researching it, finding out if there's a need, a demand, um, sorting a team, finding out who does what, building a, a, a like a value proposition, doing your sort of business model canvas, that sort of thing. Um a value proposition for, for anyone who this is new terminology to is essentially what it sounds like. It's um, a statement or a clear understanding of what your business proposal will do. So if you say, you know, we are going to, with you know, with our new business, we are going to cut down delivery, ta- delivery times of all online delivery by two days you know that's quite a valuable proposition because that's gonna mean that whoever works with you can you know use their online stores and and get things to the customer quicker it's essentially what you're gonna do as a business what you are gonna solve um business model canvas is a really useful tool um and in a later story i will have a very clear example of how this became a very 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 useful tool for me but essentially it is like a sort of it's like a business plan on stabilizers it's a very very simplistic easy business plan that you fill out by almost answering questions so it's called a canvas because it is literally like a template (laughs) pardon me it's a template um it has boxes with little titles on that say things like, um, off the top of my head, it's like, you know, competitors, customers, how will we get to market, that sort of thing. And all you have to do is just fill out everything that you can in each box. So it's a good way of foolproofing a business plan that is still being formulated. So we were were, were using this business model canvas pretty um, religiously through the two weeks to sort of understand first of all what it was like to um or what was involved in finding developing preparing an idea to treat as a business and then in the second week we actually applied that so the teams that we had worked with um in this uh in, in the first week we would work with in the second week to actually go out find some problems with you know on campus whatever it might have been, um, do research, go and find a need, find out how we can solve things, come up with an innovative idea, um, and then pr- propose that in a presentation to quite a uh, well-established, very um, seasoned entrepreneurs. So at Keist University, um, which is a... a, a it is the Korean, uh, something like the Korean Academic Institute of Science and Technology. And it's got a, a lot of support in its entrepreneurial side. And the entrepreneurship professors there, professors? Professors there are um, like from practice. They aren't just theoretically wise. They have sort of been through it themselves. One of the professors had taking a company public and things you know this these are the sort of this is our caliber people that we're pitching to so really exciting stuff and with that we were working with international students from all over we had students from um nepal um china france uh denmark where else did we have? There were Korean domestic students. We had um, Norwegian slash Swiss, someone in particular. Um, yeah, it, it was really, really varied. Um, German was another one. So these were all students that were never met before. Us from Leeds were the, were the sort of biggest group to come together there were a few who'd come from the same union who knew each other but there were there was no one who i think there was no one who who came down as a four um or from the same country so we were the sort of we we felt almost like we'd taken up places but it was a it was a really good two weeks so where do i begin where can i start off well (laughs) the (laughs) This, the, the 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 initial notable event after a 
I think it was like an 11 hour plane flight direct from London is we get off um, at uh, Incheon Airport and in the baggage collection there's a guy wearing a Leeds University hoodie so that was weird and he was Korean that was like you know you sort of acclimate into this new place and you know you sort of got your ears pricked up for unfamiliar signs and then you turn around there's a guy wearing your hoodie (laughs) that was very strange but uh, yeah what we did then I mean I don't want to this isn't really like a travel focus thing so I don't want to get too much into how the the culture was different but we um, arrived in Incheon which is near Seoul got a train to Daejeon came out of Daejeon train station and heading on over to Kaist which isn't too far out of the sea and started on our two weeks Um, I stayed with two of my who I would find out to be with teammates, uh, Peter and uh, UJ. And then we went on to start the the boot camp. So, like I say, we began by sort of looking into how a business plan is formed. And this, I mean, there's no set way of doing it and, and ideas can come from many different ways. But one method that you can use is to look at a market that could benefit from a new business and then do some research to try and find how that market can be helped and I say market here referring to you know a group in whatever context so for us it was the the university campus how can we help the university campus more um what we did in our second week where we were actually formulating things is we went out with some surveys to go and speak to as broad a, ser- as broad a selection of people as possible. So this was university students from Korea and also students from outside of Korea who were studying at the university. And the questionnaire off the top of my head was very broad and vague so that people could write whatever they wanted to. But it was generally things like what do you think of the problems on this campus? What would you like to see improved? Um, I think there were some very, like, sort of uh, broad categories that they could choose from, like um, canteens were, were one thing that came up, like problems regarding the canteens, and then we'd ask them to expand or, um, you know, other, other things on campus, like facilities and, and stuff like that. But what we found in our research was that a lot of people identified a difference in um the integration between domestic and international students now korean universities and kaist definitely take their lectures in english for the benefit of the international students because whereas korean students will learn english not all um obviously not all international students will learn korean so there's a difficulty in that the international students can't speak in the, the the mother tongue of you know the majority of students at this university. What happens then is there's a separation between the two and domestic students will stay with domestic students and international students will stay with international students and never the two shall meet. And it's funny because when we did meet domestic students in Club Ibiza, in one of the club, <laughs> the club that we went to, uh, they loved us and they were very happy to 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 see us there. And one guy in particular who haunts my dreams, he was just having a great time. <laughs> um, very, very, very enthusiastic. But that might have been the substances talking that he may or may not have consumed on the night. I don't know. I don't know. I can only assume from his dance moves and the way that he looked at us. There was a certain special glint in his eye that suggested not all was well. Um, But unfortunately, generally across the board on campus, when people are nice and sober, uh, international students and domestic students aren't, aren't getting involved with each other. Also, what I saw would happen is that when Korean students and Korean professors were talking to each other, in a more private context where, you know, there was no one that needed to hear it in English. They would just speak in in Korean. 
And because this meant that Korean students only really needed to use their English when it was a lecture, you know, they were speaking Korean to each other, the signs were in Korean, the um, they could speak to the tutors in Korean when they spoke English, and this was this was apparent from the students that we were working with when they spoke Korean. Um, sorry, when they when they had to speak English, th- there was a difficulty. There was definitely a language barrier there, and they had to try and speak clearly for us, and we had to try and speak clearly for them. Uh, it was clear there was there was a problem. So, having identified this, we looked into ways that we could solve it, and. We weren't the only ones. I think there were a few other groups. I think there was about five or six groups altogether that pitched and a couple of the others did focus on the international student and domestic student divide. What we wanted to do was achieve a reason for students to work together that would form the foundation of friendships with one another. And what was a really useful tool for us in that we had five people working on you know working together and ideating together was to use this big whiteboard um drawing all of our you know results up conclusions up every thought every mind map so that we could you know easily pair things together um and in complete honesty and i hate talking about stuff that you know could be perceived as me you know boasting or bragging or whatever but um, what happened was that I actually found myself driving this this method of doing things and it, and it did prove to be very useful because we got some very good ideas out of it. But there were a number of occasions um, where I just found myself naturally acting as the, the, the sort of... Um, the sort of conduit for everyone to work together. Um, and I don't want to say... I don't want to say like leader and things like that, but... The, the the team that I work with who were all very very talented and very very hard working s- sort of reflected and fed back the the work that I was doing to sort of be across the board and assist everyone and make sure everyone was speaking and, and make sure everyone sort of got a chance and to try other ideas um, sort of identified to me that I had settled into a, a leadership role quite naturally and I hadn't expected this in myself anyone that knows me knows I'm not necessarily an assertive person um you know I'm not particularly dominant I'm you know I'm quite easy to easy to talk to but you know I, I don't take charge of the room or anything like that I like to be more observant uh more passive actually a little story from the um Leeds to New York leadership program briefly that I don't think I actually mentioned in in this um in the episode uh, two, um, there was an exercise that we did one of the days in New York where we were split into threes and we were told to assign roles to each other. And we would cycle across these roles for each round that we do this exercise. But the three roles were listener, observer and speaker. So the listener's job was to just listen to the speaker. The speaker's job was to just talk and talk and talk and talk and talk without prompts, just to speak. The observer was to watch both and try and see what was going on. And then all would feed back to each other. And the point of this was to give everyone an opportunity to be a listener and a speaker and an observer. And I would absolutely recommend that people try this exercise maybe not as regimented because it's hard to you know organize three people talking together and doing that sort of thing but just witness next time you're being a listener or next time you're being observant or next time you're being a speaker just witness exactly what happens in each of those roles and see where you fit in well because when i was the listener i could listen and I was feeding back and talking about how the other person spoke and I was talking about how I felt to be observed when I was the speaker I was I was talking about you know how I felt to speak and that I felt maybe not uncomfortable but like you know I was sort of having to do something without any real agenda or reason and and I don't always feel comfortable in that situation so I'm not just you know a, a person who talks for talking sake what I found really resonated with me was that I was an observer and the other people who were observers tended to have a similar experience in this exercise 
um, or who found that they were more natural observers because these are the people who prefer to be quieter but aren't afraid to speak up and are very responsive and very um, aware and thinking about other people and thinking about where the conversation's going, where people's feelings are at, where people's emotions are at. Some people were very naturally speakers and these are people who could talk and had really powerful speaking skills and were very enthusiastic. Um, all of these roles have natural faults and I don't want to, you know, I'm not trying to make out that if you're an observer, you're part of the elite. The problem with the observers is we sometimes may be too quiet and miss opportunities. And sometimes we may be too, you know, pent up on observing that we forget to actually do any speaking ourselves. Listeners have an incredible power to hear the group and to see where things lie and to, you know, assimilate information and data and things like that. Um, but sometimes might not speak up when it's necessary. Speakers, on the other hand, can convey and can project, but sometimes speak too much. So I felt a real sort of home, you know, ness in this role of the observer. Um, and it helped me sort of sort of identify who I was a bit um, and to find out, actually, this is how I operate. Because it, it is very true. I am a person who looks at other situations before I jump in with my own thoughts and I'm not necessarily a quiet person I can always expand on what's on my mind but I'm not you know I'm not content to listen and I'm not content to just speak I would rather be a sort of external party to that so going back to Korea this was where my observer personality was coming into play I was very aware of you know who was not getting to speak up in the group who was um having their ideas rejected you know n not unfairly but just making sure that there was a sort of we were all moving together as a group and that no one was being left behind and part of the way that i fell into that was by picking up the pen and, and asking everyone for ideas and you know checking up on everyone making sure everyone was okay seeing if anyone had any problems that sort of thing so going back to the business idea, we'd done all this stuff on the whiteboard and found that students needed help integrating with domestic and international students. Um, and we did a bit of, of thinking and we came up with an idea that was to incentivize students to travel in groups of international and domestic students. And we thought, how can we achieve that? Well, You've got to bear in mind, this was a year after the Pokemon Go mania, you know, the summer of Pokemon Go where you'd walk outside and everyone was out trying to find Pokemon. So it was still pretty fresh in minds. Um, I thought, what if we do something along those lines where Pokemon Go, you know, the idea is that you travel together, but you don't catch Pokemon, what if instead it's more to do with claiming locations? And there are there are games and apps that exist like this at the minute. Um, anyway, but the spin on this is that you receive points for the team that you go with. The, point, the teams are randomised, but they're randomised so that it makes sure that there is a mix of people in so that you meet new people. Um, and, you know, there's like multipliers for claiming the, the, the places together. And then we also thought it could be integrated into um, things like extracurricular stuff, which would benefit your degree to go to, like you know, talks and 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 uh, you know, out, outside of course lectures and things like that. So the idea was you would have a group of friends who you would work with together to claim locations on the campus and visit events with, and through that you would lay the foundations to collaborate with them by being around them. Um, now, I'm not a person who believes in a willing audience, by which I mean there are people who sometimes 
kid themselves in thinking that things are simpler than they seem. And one of the ways that I see this happen is in, you know, talking about um, people will love this, people will love that, people will be, people will be so excited for that, people da da da. Sometimes I hear people in analysing situations with theory that I put into a human context and I'm just like, honestly, I would not do that. And when I think about gaining points, I'm very much a bit of a cynic and a sceptic because, frankly, I don't care. I don't want points. You know, it's not money. So my thinking to that was we need to make sure that there is a real redeemable um, sort of exchange system for these points. So we came up with this idea that it was actually very easy to get tangible, useful um, rewards for the points that you'd earn. So, you know, it could be like you so many points you might get a bike to go to ride around campus with or something. Or, you know, you, you, you could pay for your stationery or you could pay for a pint or something with um, the, the points that you've spent. Uh, the points that you've earned, sorry, on, on claiming these locations. And we wanted it because the the way that point based thing scales up is that you have to grind and grind and grind and it happens for, for all sorts of stuff. If you think about, you know, um micro currencies and, and premium currencies and things in apps and stuff like that, how many hours do you need to spend in a game to make the same amount of points that you could buy for like five pound? It just it just doesn't weigh up. You've got either got a grind and grind and grind, or you got to pay money. And we said, well, let's not have that. Let's have it the other way around, so that you can very easily find enough um, points to build towards something usable. Um, and we wouldn't have microcurrencies. The way it would work is that universities would pay us to set up on their campus. So it was this was our model. We'd it'd be like a sponsor model. So universities would pay us a subscription to go to the campus and set up all of these places via GPS. Um, you know, a system where they could tell us that there are lectures coming up in certain rooms and we could say, okay, well, now you've got a beacon set there that people can go and claim. Um, and that would be how we generated revenue. There would be no cost to students. And in that, um, money would go towards these um, rewards. And this was, this was the idea, essentially. And... We, we were really quite confident in it. Another thing that was going for us with our team is that we work together really, really well. And one thing I'll say absolutely is if you're ever working in a team-based um, scenario, which 100% you will be, get to know your team and make make friends with your team and don't be a person who you know doesn't pull the weight and moans about, oh, my team's not doing this, that, the other. If your team isn't working together, that's that is the perfect time for you to step up and move everyone in, in, in the right direction. The person who kicks off and says the team isn't working together is the person who is not doing what they need to be doing. And it's not about pointing fingers and making blames. It's you've got to have a good bond with your team and you've got to work together. So we, you know, we went out for like drinks after after the day and went out for food and things and it was it was really valuable especially because some of us in the team me me especially can be um or certainly me and some of the other guys in the team were like pretty happy to be like industrious because we thought you know it'd help the team if we just work 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 um there were instances where other members of the team says no let's not work tonight let's go and get some chicken or let's go and you know um, once like our, our, our Korean guy in the team said let's go and have some fried octopus and sashimi and that was a re- that was an experience um, I miss one sick so dearly uh, but it was live it was live it was it was crawling in your throat it was horrible it was nice but it was oh my god never again um, and that those those moments were so valuable yes work didn't get done for that few hours out of the evening that's fine because we had a great time and, you know, we come back the next day closer for having done that, which is important. But like I say, we had a really good team and everyone worked together really well. Um, We had uh, Peter, who was great for doing things like research and marketing, sort of, you know, pulling together statistics and pulling together uh, facts and figures and things. UJ was... um, I think his course was to do with with programming or, or 
some sort of physics um, or engineering and he put together an app demo for us. An interesting story there. So initially in one of our test runs of the presentation, the app demo, I thought that it actually wouldn't fit because we had like a strict, I can't remember how long, maybe like six minutes or something to go through this presentation. Um, and the app demo, I spoke up and I was like, I, I don't know if this is going to fit. I don't know if we've got time for this. Um, is it actually going to help the presentation to be able to see it? And UJ pushed back and I'm so thankful that he did that because we kept it in and it made all the difference. Um, this is a lesson to A, be vocal about the things you're concerned about, but B, be diplomatic in the way that you address them because you may well be wrong. You may be right, you may be wrong, but we had borderline like a heated conversation about do we really need this? And he thought he did and I thought he didn't. But then the more we talked about it, we said, okay, let's keep it in. Let's tweak a few things to make sure it's streamlined and make sure it, you know, is sewn in nicely. But then once he was in it, it was like, it was such a valuable part and he had people laughing and it was, it was such a valuable part of the presentation. We had one sick who was a Korean guy. He was part of our team. He was just full. He was so funny. Um, was able to give a lot of insight and then Sinja who was a uh, Norwegian student at, at, at uni in Switzerland um, she did a lot of you know a lot of sort of research as well and, and was able to offer a lot um, in the team and also introduced me to Latex which is some crazy word processing software that Microsoft Office has not got a candle to so we really got on as a team and my sort of role in it, and I, this was what I could bring to the table really, was that I could do the, the, the visuals in terms of logos and things like that. And one thing that we did that made us stand out from other people that I implore that you take something away from this is we did a presentation that included a short film that we shot there and then, like like the night before or two nights before or something. It was edited, it was silly, it put across the idea of, of what it is pretty well, um, but it, it, it went down really well and it was funny. And this is something that I have experienced time and time again in presentations. You should do what you can to be unconventional because people are expecting to see something. You know, in a business plan presentation, if you can make people laugh, that's so valuable. And it doesn't mean be a comedian. It doesn't mean, you know, embarrass yourself. But if you can do something that's not expected, that's still within, you know, it still belongs there. It's still telling people about what's what, giving people important information, but doing so in a way that isn't dull and dry and boring. That's so valuable. So you know, in future presentations, try and do that because there is another experience in this podcast series that I'll go into where I did the same thing and it's just it's just tried and tested and I can't vouch for it enough. But basically, by the time we came to presentation, we had like a logo, we had a name, it was called Campaign, as in Campus Campaign. Um, the logo was like this little guy with a backpack and a flag. Um you know, this silly intro, it, the presentation was rehearsed, we did a lot of like feedback, we got other groups to watch our presentation and, and give us criticism and it was it was really, really, really good and w what happened was, out of all of the pre the people who presented, we won, we won the presentation, we won the, the, the two weeks of the Global Entrepreneurship Camp, we were the winning team and we got some very nice JBL speakers out of it each, <laughs> which... Ah, fantastic. But it was just so validating to be in that experience of um, seeing a, a, a you know a, a business idea move through the motions of a business plan, become a formulated presentation where we can argue the USPs and the benefits and things like that, work together as a team, overcome things as a team, bond as a team, and then have this experience where we end up successful at the end of it. And there were other teams that did really well and had good ideas 
and presented things well. But I don't think any team had our chemistry. And I think that's a vitally important thing. I think some teams took things a little bit too seriously. Um, I think there were probably some teams that like didn't quite gel, which is unfortunate. But going forward, what I've learned from that is just how important it is to, to, to invest in your team. It's not about being competitive and it's not about being, you know, we're in it to win it work 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 it, that is not the the thing that you should be focusing on you should be open to feedback one thing that we did a lot of was what's called the iterative process which is if you know anything about lean startups and things like that the iterative process is all to do with um looking at how to develop your business idea through trial and error effectively try it see what's wrong with it try it again see what's wrong with it try it again and you just keep adding things that you can implement to fix it and it just strengthens it so much. And again, there are experiences later in the later in this podcast series where I can bring this up. Um, but it was just such a valuable experience to go and do this in a foreign environment from scratch, go through a business plan. Because the thing is as well, there are so many frameworks out there that, you know, can help you run a business, but just across any sort of field, you know, how many times have you seen... 10 things you can do to improve your smile, five important ways to improve your writing, like, you know, just arbitrary lists of things that you can do to change one thing or another. And I don't know about you, but for me, I sometimes get the feeling that the more frameworks like that and the more lists of things that I should do that I see, I get a little bit more feeling like I'm obliged to do those things. Like, oh God, I'm not doing any of these five things that this random website has just told me to do. Um, You know, I see things like the business model canvas. Oh, I've never done a business model canvas. I'm disorganized. It's not about that. It's not about that. What what really should be the thing is is that, that you take away is that you don't have to do all five things on the list or all 10 things on the list or you don't have to fill out every single framework what you need to do is understand the framework so that if a situation arises when you can use it, which is what happened for me later in the year from this, you can use it. This experience, so I already knew what a business model canvas was before I went to Korea, but actually sitting down and creating one and going through that experience of making it, filling it out, testing it, meant that later down the line when there was a real reason for me to use a business model canvas, I could just jump straight into it and it was a really useful tool and I saw the benefit of it because I had a flash idea that there was a very short time scale on to act on and was able to just bash out a business model canvas there and then find a lot of things I haven't thought about addressing. So this is what I mean. It's it's all about being aware of things that you're moving into and experiencing and being aware that things might come in handy in the future as well. But just what a good learning experience it was to be in in South Korea and just undergo this thing. Um, Just scanning over the document now um, to see if there's anything I missed, but I think I've pretty much covered anything. I know I've gone a little bit over. No, I think that's it. Let's look at the takeaways. So first of all, be ready to learn. No matter your opinion, the common goal is the most important. Hear other arguments and decide what the best move is. So this is in the context of this, um, when I thought something wasn't going to be useful and it turned out to be useful. And thankfully UJ said, no, let's keep it in. And we we decided to go with it. Um, had I been stubborn and not listened, we, you know, we might not have won. It might have detrimented our presentation. It's important that you know, teams are teams. Don't don't be like. So I hate bringing things up that make me sound like oh I'm so good and everything. But my team put me forward as the leader when when towards the end of the presentation, towards the end of the two weeks, the teams were asked to elect a leader, and then like basically we were all asked to assign roles, 
And after two weeks of working together, my team said, Owen's the leader. Owen is out of... And leader isn't... It's not a role of authority. A leader is a role that is equal to other things because a leader's job is to ensure that everyone works together. A boss is someone who tells people what to do and I'm not a boss. I'm leading by making sure everyone is working together and everyone is heard and everyone gets a chance and everyone... You know, there are no subordinates. There were no subordinates in that team. So it was important for me to have some humility because people can be goaded into, um, you know, protecting their own ideas. It can be unfamiliar for some people to hear that people don't agree with them and without thinking they just go into defending themselves. That's not what you should do. Be open to other people's ideas. Consider that you might not have all the answers. It was tough for me to have that conversation which which almost got a little bit heated but it benefited so much for it because UJ was able to stand up for what he thought was useful and it was useful and it it really did make the difference so our second takeaway is look after your team we spent a lot of time bonding outside of the camp and checking up on each other during this built a lot of trust for us it's as simple as that um you know invest in your team like i said it it did make so much of a difference um, to be friends and become friends and have a laugh and do things that were outside of the work and the project that we all had. Um, laughter is persuasive. This is the third one. Give your panel something to remember. Go beyond the monotonous cash projections and boring stats. Be human. At the end of the day, you got a load of business people sat on the other side of this panel and they've heard a million pitches before and they know business can be Dull. So don't be dull. Be funny. Give them something to laugh about. Be silly. Do you know? Be professional, but be silly. Uh, I'm going to round it off there. That is my big Korean PowerPoint adventure. Um, one thing that I want people to be able to do is to, to contact me and ask me any questions and things like that. So um, my Twitter is at I am crisps. Uh, my. What else? What else? What else? You can get me on Instagram if you want, Owen C. Rook. Um, also, there is uh, Seabrook Media is my company website, seabrook.media. Um, feel free to email me at Owen, uh, sorry, Owen at seabrook.media. Um, yeah, next time we're going to be talking about Owen infiltrates the secret circle. How I went to a paid networking event and what happened and what became of that uh spoiler alert i infiltrate the secret circle no it's uh this 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 is an interesting one i I think this is quite a useful one to hear so please feel free to feedback um i am just gonna crack on with these i haven't actually set like a, a, a schedule for uploading them but i'm just wanting to get a bit of a runway sorted and then i'll start putting them up um, at, at the point at the time of recording, none of these have been uploaded yet. But hopefully, you know, pretty soon I'll just have like you know it'll be like a weekly thing, and I'll have a plan and be able to put them up at a certain time every week or something like that. But yeah, next time we're talking about uh, networking and potentially networking in shadier ways than normal. So listen back then, and I will see you there.